Welcome to the Science and Faith Podcast with Dr. James Tour, a leading synthetic organic chemist and nanotechnologist. With over 700 research publications and 140 patent families to his name and a research team of more than 30, Dr. James Tour is advancing research in the fields of nanomaterials, nanoelectronics, and nanomedicine. Dr. Tour, a devout follower of Jesus, is also concerned with the questions that you are asking. Questions like, can a scientist believe in the supernatural? Does God exist? And if he does, is he personal and kind? Why is there such a divide between faith and science? How old is the earth? What do we know about life's origin? Is the theory of Darwinian evolution true? And are science and the Bible at odds with each other? Come just as you are with preconceived ideas, skepticism, and even cynicism. Join Dr. Tour each week as you'll hear from him and other world-renowned scientists as they present their thoughts and discuss topics of science, faith in the God of the Bible, and many things in between. You found it, the Science and Faith Podcast. Here's Dr. Tour. Welcome to the Science and Faith Podcast with Dr. James Tour. I'm James Tour, and you can find out about me by going to my website, jmtour.com, or my social media site, drjamestour.com. This particular uh, uh, event tonight or today is is uh, is in collaboration with Westview Baptist Church and Cross Point Church. And uh, if in the future you'd like to uh, be part of the audience to be able to ask questions, you can go to signup.drjamestour.com, and that you can uh, sign up there to be part of the audience for future broadcasts. So I'm a practicing scientist. And I love Jesus more than anything else in the world. And that's what makes this particular podcast unique. And with that beginning, let me just talk a little bit about our guest today. Our guest today is Dr. Henry Fritz Schaefer. And he's one of the most highly regarded chemists on the planet. Uh, he, he did his undergraduate work at MIT, his PhD at Stanford in uh, chemical physics. Both of his degrees are in chemical physics. And uh, uh, also, he's, uh, he started as, as, as a professor. Think about this. He started at a prof as a professor at, at uh, Berkeley, at Cal Berkeley, at the age of 24. He started as a professor. And he taught there for 18 years. And then he moved to the University of Georgia to be director of the Center for Computational Quantum Chemistry. And uh, he's world-renowned on his publications. He has more than 1,600 scientific publications. That's a lot. That's a lot of papers. And, uh, uh, and then he's, he's been cited more than 70,000 times. So he's very well known in the chemistry community. He's also known for his faith. Uh, he's an open and outspoken believer in Jesus Christ. He lectures all over the world. Uh, and and uh, I've known Fritz for more than 25 years. And I'm always amazed because he sends out these emails on... Uh, where his travelings are going to be. He says, I'll be leaving for India tomorrow and going at the, these six locations. And so he gives these lectures all over the world. And we're going to hear one of his lectures today. But before we do that, I'm going to ask him a really important question. So Fritz, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Jim. You can turn okay. Off. And I want to ask you a really important question before we get before we begin. I just gave this overview of of, of uh, your remarkable education and background and everything. Why do you, as an educated person, how can you believe in something so amazing as a physical resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, I think the historical evidence is, is very strong. <clears throat> the alternative is to conclude that Jesus' closest friends uh, were engaged in a vast conspiracy to feed themselves to the lions. And the probability of that seems very small to me. Well, that was concise. I appreciate it. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you to, to take over and just, just give us this amazing talk, which I, I heard more than 25 years ago, but I'm going to hear it because it's been heavily revised over the years. The Big Bang, Stephen Hawking, and God. <clears throat> so here's our title, and uh, this is, is the date. 
this is where we work, the Center for Computational Quantum Chemistry. Wonderful new building. Uh, my students and I uh, take up all the upper floor and a little bit of the lower floor. <clears throat> Here are my students. This They are socially distanced. Um, all these students were uh, are here now, or or uh, close to here, and uh, just a great group of people to work with. Fourteen PhD students, several senior workers, and and uh, some undergraduates, and so on and so forth. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about worldview for just a little bit. Um, everybody has one, and uh, has experiences and out of them forms a worldview. Carefully thought out worldview reflects the deep hunger among human beings for an overarching framework to bring unity to their lives. Uh, now, um, I should say a little bit about the relationship between my own research and uh, the title of this lecture. And uh, so here is my first paper on interstellar molecules, molecules that inhabit the uh, most sparsely populated, that is in terms of molecules, parts of the, of, of the universe. So this is from 1973, and we're still quite actively engaged uh, in, in this research, our uh, 2018 paper shown there. <clears throat> What's cosmology? Um, it's probably, it's, it, well, it's the study of the universe as a whole, its structure, origin, and development. <clears throat> um, the questions it addresses are profound, both scientifically and more generally, such as, is the universe finite or infinite in content and extent? Most important, is the universe eternal or did it have a beginning? Was the universe created? If not, how did it get here? And uh, if so, how was this creation accomplished? What can we learn about the agent and events of creation? Now, there are many, many more points here, and I would refer you to Hugh Ross's excellent book called The Fingerprint of God. Now, <clears throat> there's been great resistance to this idea that the universe had a beginning. Oftentimes, a very distinguished scientist, uh, Arthur Eddington, experimentally confirmed Einstein's general theory of relativity in 1919, stated a dozen years later, philosophically, the notion of a beginning to the present order of nature is repugnant to me. I should like to find a genuine loophole. Um, Albert Einstein's reaction to the consequences of his own general theory of relativity appears to acknowledge the threat of an encounter with God through the equations of general relativity. We can trace the origin of the universe backward in time to some sort of a beginning. However, before publishing his cosmological inferences, Einstein introduced a cosmological constant of fudge factor uh, to yield to force upon the upon the uh, universe, a static model for the universe. He uh, later changed his mind and said that was his biggest mistake. Ultimately gave grudging acceptance to what he called the necessity for a beginning and eventually to what he called the presence of a superior reasoning power. But he never did accept the reality of a personal God, a God who is concerned about uh, each person in our audience. Uh, there are five ancient arguments uh, for the existence of God. I'm only going to mention one here. Uh, if you've taken an elementary philosophy course, you've seen them all. But the one I want to talk about is the cosmological argument. The effect of the universe's existence must have a suitable cause. <clears throat> Why such strong resistance to the idea of a definite beginning of the universe? Why was Arthur Eddington so unhappy about that idea? Well, let's try to break it down into three parts. Cosmological argument. Everything that begins to exist must have a cause. That's how we do science. Now, suppose our universe began to exist, then the universe must have a cause. And I think you can see that is a line of thought which would be discomforting to people. And, and the best way to fight this is to argue that the universe did not have a beginning. Uh, Robert Dickey. Uh, some time ago, uh, said that an infinitely old universe would relieve us of the necessity of understanding the origin of matter at any finite time in the past. Uh, the strongest statement is by Walter Nernst, a Nobel Prize winner for his discovery of the third law of thermodynamics. And this is, this is strong. He said, to deny the infinite duration of time would betray 
the very foundations of science, a, a strong, uh, 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 very strong statement. If he were with us today, he would feel betrayed. Um, Simon Singh's little book called The Big Bang, six years ago, 16 years ago, uh, addresses the question, is the Big Bang theory a Christian conspiracy? He quotes Fred Hoyle, who we'll hear a little more about later. Hoyle was equally scathing when it came to the Big Bang's association with religion, condemning the Big Bang theory as a model built on Judeo-Christian foundations. Uh, Stephen Barr, um, University of Delaware, has been quite active in, in these discussions and says this, the historical fact is that Christians believed in the beginning of time, while scientific materialists strongly preferred the idea of an ageless universe. 1946, George Gamow, Russian-born American scientist, proposed that the primeval fireball, or Big Bang, was an intense concentration of pure energy. It was the source of all the matter that now exists in our universe. The theory predicts that all the galaxies in uh, the universe should be rushing away from each other at high speeds as a result of that initial Big Bang. <clears throat> Forward 22 years, 65, observation of the microwave background radiation by, by Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, Wilson from the Bell Telephone Labs, convinced most scientists of the validity of the Big Bang theory. Further observations, which we'll talk about beginning in 92 and going to the present, have moved the Big Bang theory from a consensus view to the nearly unanimous view among cosmologists that there was an origin to our universe approximately 13.7 billion years ago. Let's get a definition. Hot Big Bang Theory states that the entire physical universe, all the matter and energy, and even the four dimensions of space and time burst forth from a state of infinite or near-infinite near density, temperature, and pressure. Uh, very unusual circumstances. <clears throat> Arno Penzias, um, who shared the Nobel Prize with Robert Wilson for their, for their um, work on the... Uh, um, on the Big Bang <clears throat> confirmations, uh, six months before he got the no, maybe seven months before he got the Nobel Prize, he said this to the New York Times: "The best data we have concerning the Big Bang are exactly what I would have predicted had I nothing to go on but the five books of Moses, the Psalms, the Bible as a whole." Remarkable. Oh, here they are: <clears throat> Penzias and, and Wilson. Uh, Penzias is the one with the wonderful bald head and. Uh, and Wilson is the other. Um, now, Penzias is still living, but he has not changed his mind about these things. And in 95, he was asked why some cosmologists were so affectionate in their embrace of an infinitely old universe. And this is what he said. Well, some people are uncomfortable with the purposefully created world. To come up with things that contradict purpose, they tend to speculate about things they haven't seen, such as an infinitely old universe. Dennis Shama <clears throat> fits into our story in a couple ways. Uh, he uh, was Stephen Hawking's thesis advisor at Cambridge University, and he, <clears throat> he's no longer with us, but in his, in his time, he's been gone for three or four years, uh, perhaps the most prominent advocate of the steady state theory of the universe, the idea that our universe is infinitely old. He gave up on the steady state hypothesis and had a press conference and announced this in quite a, quite a humorous and intriguing way. He says, the steady state theory has a sweep in beauty, much of which he was responsible for, that for some unaccountable reason, the architect of the universe appears to have overlooked. I hope you like that. Now, <clears throat> George Smoot, uh, scientific le t team leader uh, of uh, the group for which the Nobel Prize was given in 2006. <clears throat> Smoot um, and I were classmates together at MIT. Uh, we both showed up in, uh, I guess it was September of 1962, and we both graduated on time in May of of, uh, of 96 and uh, 66. And uh, Smoot was, uh, well, let's just Say, what shall I say? Smoot was very well known, but it wasn't for anything he might accomplish in the future in physics. This is his announcement of the Big Bang Ripples experiments for which he got the Nobel Prize, observed by the Kobe satellite, Kobe Cosmic Background Explorer of NASA. 
He says, it's like looking at God. This this appeared on the front page of the New York Times. So this is a, a, a really startled a lot of people. <clears throat> Science historian Frederick Burnham, one week later, gave a, a, a summary of this. He says, these findings, Big Bang Ripples, now available, make the idea that God created the universe more a more respectable hypothesis today than at any time in the last 100 years. Is the Big Bang Theory a Christian conspiracy? Uh, Jeffrey Burbage, uh, we lost 10 years ago, was a very famous astrophysicist, one of the tiny number of scientists rejecting the Kobe conclusions by the year 2010. He not only rejected them, he said they came from philosophy. He, he continued to believe the universe to be infinitely old to the end. Uh, but he discounted these new experiments as coming from, quote, the first church of Christ of the Big Bang. Now that was, uh, uh, my friend Smoot, George Smoot didn't like that very much. And he had his own pre uh, press conference and said, in fact, none of the 17 members of my research term has, team has any connection to the first church of Christ of the Big Bang. Burbage favored the steady state hypothesis, a view that he said supports Hinduism, not Christianity. Here's George Smoot in his book, Wrinkles in Time. He wrote this uh, before uh, he got the Nobel Prize. Uh, this is what he says. There is no doubt that a parallel exists between the Big Bang as an event and the Christian notion of creation from nothing. Charles Bennett, uh, Johns Hopkins University, talks about his own experiments, Wilkinson Probe, uh, Big Bang ripples have been confirmed by more recent and continuing results from the Wilkinson microwave and isotropy probes, probe, WMAP. And this is what Bennett had to say to Science, Science Watch. He said the, the Wilkinson probe launched in 2001 and has now mapped the temperature variations or anisotropy of the cosmic microwave background radiation over the full sky with unprecedented accuracy and precision. Uh, <clears throat> Bertram Schwartzwild just uh, Schwartzwild child just recently in Physics Today, the kind of the, the uh, New York Times of the physics community, uh, titled his article "New Cosmic Microwave Background Results Strengthen the Case for Inflationary Big Bang Cosmology." Now, what is all this about? Uh, when you get a long way from anything in our universe, <clears throat> uh, the the temperature is not absolute zero. It's not warm, but it's 2.725 uh, degrees Kelvin. It's very, very cold, but not zero. And uh, <clears throat> in fact, what the Big Bang ripples uh, mapped were differences in this temperature in different regions of space. Uh, and the observations fit the Big Bang predictions extremely well. And that's as, as, as well as we can do. In, in theoretical chemistry, theoretical physics, to make predictions in advance and have them confirmed by later experiments. Adrian Cho, another article in Science Magazine, is titled, Long Awaited Data, Sharpened Picture of the Universe's Birth. Uh, I'm glad that, uh, that uh, uh, a lot of these uh, naysayers uh, did not live to, to see this uh, statement of the universe's birth. Here's a timeline. This is due to Alan Guth. Uh, and over here on the left-hand side, we see kind of the Big Bang, and then various things happen. And here we are today on the right-hand side, the Wilkinson probe, and a period of 13.7 billion years. Now, <clears throat> where are we going with this? By definition, time is that dimension in which cause and effect phenomena take place. No time, no cause and effect. Thus, time's beginning is concurrent with the beginning of the universe, as the space-time theorem says. It follows that the cause of the universe must be some entity operating in a time dimension completely independent of and pre-existent to the time dimension of our cosmos. This conclusion is powerfully important to our understanding of who God is and who or what God is not. It tells us that the creator is transcendent, operating beyond the dimensional limits of our universe. It tells us that God is not the universe itself, nor is God contained within the universe. And if you're saying, well, I knew that already, uh, that God is not the universe itself, nor is God contained within the universe, there are a couple billion people on our, our planet who uh, believe one or both of these things. This is from Hugh Ross, um, another book of his, The Creator in the Cosmos, excellent. Leon Letterman, 
Nobel Prize in Physics, 1988, for uh, particle accelerator experiments, has that Letterman has just passed, has the, um, the best title of all these books. Um, I guess I should have said, and that perhaps most people know, that Stephen Hawking's book, A Brief History of Time, has sold more than 25 million copies, exceeding by a factor of 25 any book ever published on science. Uh, but others decided this might be a good way to improve their retirement funds. And uh, Letterman wrote the book with the best title, The God Particle. And uh, th I don't think this is a great book, uh, but the introduction is, is amazing. And so I'll quote it. He says, in the very beginning, there was a void, a curious form of vacuum, a nothingness containing no space, no time, no matter, no light, and no sound. Yet the laws of nature were in place, and this curious vacuum held potential. A story logically begins at the beginning, but this story is about the universe, and unfortunately, there are no data for the very beginning. He wants to emphasize this. He says, none, zero. We don't know anything about the universe until it reaches the mature age of a billionth of a trillionth of a second. That is some very short time after the creation of the Big Bang, when you read or hear Anything about the birth of the universe, someone is making it up. We are in the realm of philosophy. Only God knows what happened at the very beginning. Leon Letterman, the God Particle. Stephen Hawking, uh, in his book, said similar things. The actual point of creation lies outside the scope of the presently known laws of physics. And Alan Guth, who we'll talk about a little bit later, kind of his uh, North American counterpart, the instant of creation remains unexplained. Uh, so this uh, the notion of creation is, is uh, just inherent in these statements. Here's Alan Guth in his office at MIT. Um, some of you are under the mistaken impression uh, that professors, science professors are very tidy, but you can see this is, this is not the case here. Now, Stephen Hawking died in, in March, uh, a bit more than two years ago. He certainly was the best-known scientist in the world. His net worth at the time of his death was $20 million, despite his staggering medical expenses, including round-the-clock professional medical care for 25 years. Here is my favorite picture of, of Stephen Hawking. He, this picture was taken when he was about 65, I think, and I think he looks about 40 years old in that picture, but this is, this is my favorite picture of him. Uh, <clears throat> he... Um, Became famous first between 1968 and 1970 with uh, his co uh, work co-authored with Roger Penrose and George Ellis. Uh, George Ellis, I know quite well. We'll come back to him. Uh, they demonstrated that every solution to the equa equations of general relativity guarantees the existence of a singular boundary for space and time in the past. This result is now known as the singularity theorem. Uh, Hawking went on to do things himself and with his PhD students, for example, 1974, quantum evaporation of black holes, exploding back black holes, and Hawking radiation. Oh, here is a here's a artist's conception of a black hole. This is about 20 years old. This art it's in one of Stephen Hawking's books, and it's entitled "Black Hole Rips Matter from a Companion Star." Uh, yeah, I, I, I like this. Now, what's happened since then? is the first black hole has been observed. Um, now, why was this such a big deal? It's, um, it's uh, three years ago, April 2017. Uh, this, um, the Event Horizon Telescope project turned eight satellites toward one point in space. Scientists were trying to take a photo that would confirm years of speculation and theorizing about black holes. They were taking a picture of the now famous black hole in the middle of of uh, uh, this galaxy this year. Hawking surely was the most famous physicist in history who did not receive the Nobel Prize. Uh, in fact, one year, probably within the last five years, they, uh, the Nobel Prize Committee wrote a, wrote a one-page essay on why Hawking didn't get it. And what they said is that the Swedish Royal Academy demands that an award-winning discovery uh, must be supported by verifiable experimental or observational evidence, and Hawking's work remains unproved. 
Although the mathematics of his theories is considered beautiful and elegant, science waited until 1994 for the first solid evidence, not an observation, uh, for the existence of black holes, the verification of Hawking radiation, or his more radical theoretical proposals seems far off. Now, that said, if some of aspects of Hawking's research turn out to be wrong, he will still have had a profound impact on the history of scientific thought. He is truly a, a great scientist in addition to being a very brave man. Now, <clears throat> all this um, came to the, to the public through this movie, uh, The Theory of Everything. And this, uh, this guy who looks like Harry Potter, uh, Eddie Redmayne, won the, the, the ultimate uh, Academy Award for the best actor. Uh, and um, these pictures have some of, of, of Eddie and some of Hawking. Now, on the upper left, that is Eddie Redmayne. Next to him is the real Stephen Hawking. Uh, on the upper right, I think that's the real Stephen Hawking. And maybe on the on the lower left, I'm not sure. I mean, they did such a good job in this movie. I'm not sure whether that's the, the real thing or Eddie. On the right, we have uh, Eddie all by himself. And to me, he looks very much like Harry Potter. Uh, oh, here, this is cute. Uh, Stephen Hawking, his first wife, Jane Wilde, posed with their actor counterparts, Eddie Redmayne and Felicity Jones. Eddie Redmayne is a tall guy. So uh, there they are all together. Um, now, let's go back to the start of of uh, Hawking's career, uh, um, New Year's Eve, 1962, Stephen Hawking met the woman we saw on the previous slide, Jane Wilde. Just one month later, he is diagnosed with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, and given two years to live. What a what a terrible uh, prediction! I've had three uh, colleagues, scientific colleagues, who uh, uh, got this ALS disease, and they were all gone within th th five years of the of the um, diagnosis. At this point, Stephen was, by all accounts, a pretty average performing graduate student at Cambridge. That, that's okay. Cambridge is a great university, and average students are pretty good by the standards of the rest of the world. Uh, let's go back to his first uh, biographers, uh, Michael White and John Gribben. Look at this point, and they wrote this. There's little doubt that Jane's appearance on the scene was a major turning point in Hawking's life. The two of them began to see a lot more of one another and a strong relationship developed. It was finding Jane Wilde that enabled him to break out of his depression and regenerate some belief in his life and work. For Hawking, his engagement to Jane Wilde was probably the most important thing that had ever happened to him. It changed his life, gave him something to live for, and made him determined to live. Without the help that Jane Wilde gave him, he almost certainly would not have been able to carry on or had the will to do so. And they were married uh, after he was supposed to be no longer living. I think I have a photo. There's the wedding. He has a cane already, but he's, he's looking pretty good six months after he's supposed to be dead. Um, his parents on the left, her parents on the right. Now we could talk stories about both of them, but we won't. <clears throat> and... Uh, it's, it's not just his biographers that said that Hawking himself said, oh, what really made a difference was I got engaged to a woman named Jane Wilde. That gave me something to live for. Jane Wilde uh, is an interesting person in her own right. She has a PhD in, um, I hope I can get this right, in the medieval lyric poetry of the Iberian Peninsula and uh, Spain and and. and and Portugal. Here's, here's her statement. Without my faith in God, I wouldn't have been able to live in this situation. They were married for, I guess, 25 years. Wouldn't have been able to marry Stephen in the first place because I wouldn't have had the optimism to carry me through and I wouldn't be able to carry on with it. Now, the reason for Hawking's amazing success as a popularizer, not just doing science, but, but making it available to the public, is that he addresses some pretty basic problems of meaning and purpose that concern all thinking people. The book overlaps with Christian belief, and it does so deliberately, but it is graciously and without rancor. It's an important book and needs to be treated with respect and attention. Um, <clears throat> there is a main character in the book, A Brief History of Time, and that character is introduced on about page 30 or 40 
in which he says this, it is difficult to discuss the beginning of the universe without mentioning the concept of God. My work on the origin of the universe is on the borderline between science and religion, but I try to stay on the scientific side of that border. It's quite possible that God acts in ways that cannot be described by scientific laws. And elsewhere, he says, I thought I'd left the question of the existence of a supreme being completely open and continues, it would be perfectly consistent with all we know to say that there was a being, capital B, who was responsible for all the laws of physics. This is his uh, essay in The American Scientist. When asked uh, any number of times whether Hawking believed that science and Christianity were competing philosophies, he said, of course not. If that had been true, then Isaac Newton would not have discovered the law of gravity, Hawking, knowing Isaac Newton to, been, to have been a Christian. Now, the book makes some intentionally ambig amb ambiguous statements, and some of them I just love, uh, like this one. Hawking says, even if there's only one possible unified theory, it is just a set of rules and equations. What is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes the universe to describe them? And this one, too. Uh, uh, God not only plays dice, he sometimes throws them where they can't be seen. This is a response to um, Albert Einstein's famous statement that uh, while well, he didn't believe in quantum mechanics, uh, that God does not play dice with the universe. So Hawking obviously disagrees with him, does believe in quantum mechanics. In a brief history of time, oh, this is the best thing, I think, in the brief history of time. It, it addresses a, a question that concerned some people today. The idea that God might want to change his mind like I said, it's an example of the fallacy pointed out by St. Augustine. He, uh, Hawking likes Augustine, of imagining time as a being existing, imagining God as a being existing in time. Time is a property only of the universe that God created. And then we see his humor again. Presumably God knew what he intended when he set it up. Uh, so up until, what will he say, 2015, it appeared that uh, Hawking did believe in God, um, not a personal God, but it, it appeared that he did believe in God and he was quoted favorably by um, religious people. Um, and he did have a rather full life. Here he is at zero gravity in 2007, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and a person that can't walk. I mean, this has got to be a tremendous experience. Uh, accepting his disability, Stephen Hawking had an adventurous life. Uh, and I'm saying till about 2010, Hawking seemed friendly toward belief in God. He even went to a church occasionally with his first wife. And sometimes he let the, the kids in the congregation play with his, uh, his amazing wheelchair, the most amazing wheelchair ever constructed. However, in 2014, now this is getting on, this is just about six years ago, while lecturing in the Canary Islands, you see, he, he gets around, he stated that he changed his mind. His exact statement, I am an atheist. Um, yeah, this is Alan Guth. Let me get back to him um, and talk about his. No, I don't think I will get back to him. This will go on too long. It's a great paper. You ought to read it. Well, maybe I will do it. Uh, this, um, this paper addressed the question of whether there was a Big Bang, but the universe is nevertheless... Um, eternal. And the idea um, was that, yes, there was a Big Bang in our universe, but before that, there was a big crunch, another universe that came together. Before that, a Big Bang. And this goes on all the way back. And and uh, Alan Guth, uh, who also doesn't have the Nobel Prize yet, um, put this to rest, showed that even if the universe contains enough mass to halt its current expansion, any ultimate collapse would end in a thud, not a bounce. So only one Big Bang. Early 1998, two observational research teams, that is people that look into the sky, uh, independently made the startling and announcing announcement stating that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. It's getting more and more faster all the time. Saul Perlmutter, Berkeley, Brian Schmidt, Australian National University. Um, science called this the discovery of the year for 1998 and uh, 16 years later, Nobel Prize in Physics. 
Alan Lightman has written an interesting book called The Origins of Lives and World, The Lives and Worlds of Modern Cosmologists, published at Harvard uh, University Press. I'm surprised that any uh, responsible MIT uh, graduate uh, would, uh, would be involved with Harvard University Press. But that's another question. And this is what he says. He says, indeed, contrary to popular myth, scientists appear to have the same range of attitudes about religious matters as does the general public. That is to say, having a PhD in science doesn't seem to have a whole lot to do with whether one believes in God or not. Uh, Charles Towns was a colleague of mine at uh, Berkeley, a remarkable person. In some sense, I uh, followed him for a good part of my life. When I uh, began that um, <clears throat> my undergraduate studies at MIT, Charlie Towns was the, um, and I've spelled his name wrong too, there's no E at the end, uh, was the um, uh, the provost of MIT. He had already discovered the laser. He hadn't gotten the Nobel Prize for it quite yet, but it was it was obviously coming, and they was about to get the Nobel Prize, and he had what we sometimes describe as the Nobel disease. That is, after you win the Nobel Prize, what else is there to do in life? And uh, so Charlie became an administrator, provost, the second highest administrator at MIT, and he did it um, the whole four years that I was there, and he hated the job. Uh, just just hated it, and he went back to science. He moved to Berkeley. He am a faculty member there in 1966, and he was there the whole 18 years I was there and only died recently. And this is from his autobiography, which I think we're going to show at the bottom. In my view, the question of origin seems always left unanswered if we explore from a scientific view alone. Thus, I believe there is a <clears throat> need for some religious a metaphysical explanation. I believe in the concept of God and in his existence. Uh, this is it from his book, Making Waves, uh, published by American Institute, and especially from the last chapter called Spiritual Views from a Scientific Base. Arthur Schallow, also no longer with us, uh, professor of physics at Stanford, uh, Nobel 1981. He was very visible on campus when uh, when I was a PhD student at Stanford. He certainly was the most beloved member of the uh, Stanford Physics Department, always had a smile on his face. Uh, students would stop him as he walked across campus. He'd love to talk to them. Quite a, quite, a remarkable, uh, quite a remarkable person. And this is his statement. We're fortunate to have the Bible, and especially the New Testament, which tells us so much about God in widely accessible human terms. There's a context to most every statement, and the context is uh, he's he's comparing what we can learn with science uh, with what we can learn about other things. And he's saying that although the Bible is widely accessible in human terms, that sometimes science, not so much, identifies himself as a Christian. George Ellis is my friend. I met him on the waterfront at, uh, at Cape Town, maybe about hmm, 2014, something like that. He's uh, uh, been professor of physics, applied mathematics forever at the University of Cape Town, and also a, um, a very heroic person. He was a, a, a very strong opponent of the, the, uh, the apartheid system and uh, nearly went to jail on, on many occasions. I asked George... Uh, why didn't you go to jail? He said, well, I got right to the point where I was going to jail and it didn't seem like it was going to serve much purpose. So a distinguished cosmologist, co-author with Stephen Hawking on the classic book, The Large-Scale Structure of Space-Time. Now, that, to my knowledge, this is the only book that uh, that Stephen Hawking uh, published that's all physics. Um, and uh, it's a classic book. And that means it sold 2,000 copies. Uh, and in... in uh, and these two things are not together, but George Ellis has uh, made this statement. God's nature is revealed most perfectly in the life and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, as recorded in the New Testament. <clears throat> we met most recently in Germany uh, a couple of summers ago where he was a uh, visiting professor at uh, the University of Munich, as I was. John Polkinghorne, <clears throat> professor of mathematical physics at Cambridge. There, there are two professorships of theoretical physics in uh, in Cambridge, and one is the one Hawking held, and the other is Polkinghorne's, and he later became uh, president of Queen's College in Cambridge. This is his statement. I take God very seriously indeed. 
I'm a Christian believer and believe that God exists and has made himself known in human terms in Jesus Christ, John Polkinghorne. John Barrow, I, I knew pretty well during my years at Berkeley. It's been a while since I was professor at Berkeley. I still go back every summer. Uh, but uh, John Barrow <clears throat> is now professor of mathematical sciences at Cambridge. That's the position that Polkinghorne had. And uh, he used to show up at Berkeley every January and February. Uh, and he, he initially, he was a very quiet guy. The rest of it, he met with the Christian faculty for lunch every week. It took a long time for the rest of us to, he was only a, a lecturer at the University of Sussex back then. So we weren't quite sure who he was. And eventually he kind of opened up and said he, he did cosmology uh, for, for a living. And, and uh, I asked him, uh, I said, John, why are you always in Berkeley on January and February? And his response was, have you ever been in Cambridge in January and February? I said, yes, I did. And the fog was oppressive. He says, that's why I'm at Berkeley. Uh, this is his statement <clears throat> upon receiving a, a million euro prize. I certainly don't believe there's some fundamental difference or conflict between a theistic, that is Christian perspective on the world and the practice of uh, practice size. He's a member of the Reformed Church in Cambridge. <clears throat> yeah, then cosmologists wrote the book on the fine tuning of the universe. Alan Sandage, astronomer, and in Pasadena, also just passed, uh, did not get the Nobel Prize, but he got a prize worth half a million dollars, Crawford Prize of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. And this is from his, what he has to say in this book uh, I quoted before, Origins, Lives and Worlds of Modern Cosmologists. He has asked the ancient question, well, maybe not so ancient, 200 years can a person be a scientist and also be a Christian? And he talks about how he is and how he became a Christian at the age of 50. He says, yes, the world is too complicated in all its parts and interconnections to be due to chance alone. I'm convinced that the existence of life with all its order and each of its organisms is simply too well put together. Now, this is not the way this story is supposed to go. I mean, the, the story should have gone that uh, Sandage was in the Atacama Desert in Chile uh, at, uh, at one of these uh, most outstanding telescopes in the, in the world. He went outside for a break. He looked up in the sky and he was just overwhelmed by the, uh, the enormity of, uh, of the universe and, and God's uh, responsibility for it. No, he said, biology made me do it. Here's Don Page. He's, a, he's an excellent friend of mine. Uh, this is from four pages in uh, one of the major newspapers in Canada, The Beautiful Mind of Don Page. Uh, he, uh, Page is a good guy. Let's see what else I'm going to bring up here. Yeah, collaborated with Stephen Hawking on applications of quantum theory to gravitational physics and cosmology. He actually lived in the Hawking home for three years when he was postdoctoral fellow with Hawking, and uh, his job was to get Stephen up and going in the morning, make sure he had some breakfast, and get him over to uh, the laboratory. Uh, and he said this, I'm a conservative Christian in the sense of pretty much taking the Bible seriously for what it says. Of course, I know that certain parts are not intended to be read literally, so I'm not precisely a literalist, but I try to believe in the meaning I think it is intended to have. It's a it's a good statement. Well, he invited me to <clears throat> the University of Alberta to give a, a very early version of this lecture. It's almost all different now. And when we were done, he said, Schaefer, come on into my office. I have, I have a few questions to ask you. And uh, uh, I said, sure, <clears throat> thinking we were going to go to lunch. Um, but um, this, this question period wasn't so much a question period. He was just explaining to me in more and more and more and more detail everything he thinks about uh, about cosmology. And I never did get any lunch uh, that day, which is kind of sad, but uh, it was a wonderful conversation. Uh, <clears throat> this is a statement. I, I said to Don, I know you're a Christian, and this statement back here, this is known by everybody. Sometimes it's even in, in physics textbooks. Uh, I said, give me something that nobody knows about. Give me something that's really new. And this is what he gave me. If the universe basically is very simple, the theological implications of this would need to be worked out. Perhaps the mathematical simplicity of the universe is a reflection of the personal simplicity of the gospel message. And I'm going on with his statement that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to bridge the gap 
between himself and each of us who have rejected God or rejected what he wants for us by rebelling against his will and disobeying him. This is a message simple enough even to be understood by children. Don Page. Chris Isham, <clears throat> very famous professor of theoretical physics at Imperial College London. Imperial is a very distinguished university, maybe just a, a small step behind Oxford and Cambridge. Isham was labeled Britain's greatest quantum gravity expert by Paul Davies, a well-known uh, writer. And this is no compliment because Stephen Hawking is British and what he does for a living is quantum uh, gravity. We don't need to take sides in that, uh, in that uh, discussion. I will say that Isham, uh, I, I gave, uh, again, a very early lecture on this topic at Imperial College. And uh, Aisham was my host and introduced me and said, um, said to me, um, let's go into my office so I can ask you a few questions. And this is a couple of years after the Don Page no lunch arrangement. I, so I was very, very nervous about this. But we went into his office and he asked me a few questions. And he took me to a wonderful Indian restaurant not far from the Imperial College uh, campus. This is something from Chris Aisham. The God of Christianity is not only the ground of being, he's also incarnate. Ground of being, a term that uh, Paul Tillich used to like to use, uh, God of Christianity is incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ. And, and Chris continues, essential therein is the vision of the resurrection, as the new creation of the old order, and the profound notion of the redemption of time through the life and death of Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, Rick Smalley, former colleague of Professor James Tour, in fact, they have a number of important papers together, uh, died way too young, uh, just at the age of 62, is the father of nanotechnology, Nobel Prize in Chemistry, 1966, and, uh, and he was a good friend of mine as well. We, uh, I, I, uh, one of the few failures in, in Rick's uh, life took place when he interviewed for a faculty position at Berkeley, I think it was 1981 or thereabouts, and he was turned down because they thought he was too old to become a professor. He'd taken his time getting getting along. Um, but we became good friends at that point. I wanted to hire him. Um, but um, a typical meeting between Rick Smalley and myself is he would say, Schaefer, are you still a Christian? I said, of course I am. I said, Rick, are you still an atheist? He said, yes, I am. And he was an infamous atheist. Well, let me make that statement more neutral. He was he was a very vocal atheist and until he had a discussion with Jim Tour in about the year 2000. And maybe Jim can explain that to you at the end. But that began something new. And Rick's quote, uh, recently, this is before his death, obviously, I've gone back to church regularly. Now, Rick Smalley had not entered a church in at least 40 years. Um, gone back to church with a new focus to understand as best I can what it is that makes Christianity so vital and powerful in the lives of billions of people today. Even though almost 2,000 years have passed since the death and resurrection of Christ. Uh, amazing from Rick Smalley. Although I suspect I will never fully understand, I think I now think the answer is very simple. It is true. A remarkable statement by Rick. And he, he's going to continue here uh, to talk about the Big Bang. He says, God did create the universe about 13.7 billion years ago, and of necessity has involved himself with his creation ever since. The purpose of this universe is something that only God knows for sure, but it is increasingly clear to modern science that the universe was exquisitely fine-tuned to enable human life. We are somehow critically involved in his purpose. Our job is to sense that purpose as best we can, love one another, and help God get the job done. Uh, th this is maybe not the best theology ever, but uh, it shows the tremendous heart that, uh, that, uh, that Rick Smalley had for Jesus Christ. Now, I'm getting ready to come to some concluding comments. Uh, perhaps preparatory to that, let me say that the Big Bang represents an immensely powerful, yet carefully planned and controlled release of matter, energy, space, and time. All this is accomplished within the strict confines of very carefully fine-tuned physical constants and laws. 
power and care this explosion reveals exceed human mental capacity by multiple orders of magnitude. So where do we go from here? Here's where I go from here uh, with seven concluding points, all brief. A creator must exist. The Big Bang ripples and the Wilkinson probe are clearly pointing to an ex nihilo creation consistent with the first few verses of the book of Genesis. Two, this creator must have awesome power and wisdom. Quantity of material and the power resources within our universe are truly immense. This information or intricacy uh, manifest in any part of the universe, and especially in a living organism, as Alan Sandage said, is beyond our ability to comprehend. And what we do see is only what God has shown us within our four dimensions of space and time. Third, this creator's loving. The simplicity, balance, order, elegance, and beauty seen throughout the universe uh, demonstrate that God is loving rather than capricious. Uh, this creator is just and requires justice. Inward reflection and outward investigation affirm human beings have a conscience. The conscience reflects the reality of right and wrong and the necessity of obedience. Each of us falls hopelessly short of the creator standard. Uh, perhaps the most obvious characteristic of humankind is selfishness. Uh, we uh, down deep somewhere, each one of us uh, thinks the, the universe revolves around us, or at least we think that it should revolve around us. Um, this is what selfishness is. Who can keep his or her thoughts and attitudes pure for even an hour? And I, I like to quote the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin here, because as a young man at age 17, he decided he was not going to sin anymore. He, his life was going to be perfect. There were going to be no, no faults. And um, he tried it for a while and it didn't work. And he said to himself, or something like this, you can read about this, um, I think a lifetime is too long. I think I will just uh, just be good for uh, a year. Tried that. This kept going down. It got to the point where one day he, he couldn't keep his attitudes, thoughts pure, and, uh, and he gave up on this plan. Um, because this creator is loving, wise, and powerful, made a way to rescue us. When we come to a point of concern about our personal failings, we can begin to understand from the creation around us that God's love, wisdom, and power are sufficient to deliver us from this otherwise hopeless situation. If we trust our lives totally to the rescuer, Jesus Christ, we will be saved. The only path is to give up all human attempts to satisfy God's requirements and put our trust solely in Jesus Christ and his means of redemption, namely his death on the cross. Um, thank you very much. That was, that was amazing. This is, the talk has changed in the last 25 or 27 years since I last saw it. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I think rather than ask you any questions, because there's a bunch of questions that have come in that, that from the audience that I'm going to ask you, I'll just I'll just uh, uh, give a, f a couple minutes to say what happened with Rick Smalley. Yeah, he was he was antagonistic. He was antagonistic against the gospel, against Jesus Christ, against Christians. And then at one point, we were both flying together to speak with the CEO of Intel about. I, I about molecular electronics and he about carbon nanotube electronics. And we just happened to sit next to each other on the flight. He and I drove up together and then we kind of split up at the airport. I said, I'll see you on the flight. And we both got bumped up because of our status in the first class right next to each other. And he turned to me during the flight and he looked at me. He said, do you believe all that stuff in the Bible? I said, I think I do. Why do you ask? And uh, he said, finally, someone with a brain that I can talk to. And, uh, and so we spoke for about an hour and he had questions about dating, uh, uh, isotope dating and, and the age of the universe and things like that. And after about an hour, he said, you know, you know why you talk to me? I said, what do you mean? He says, why you, you, you just engage with me in this conversation. I said, why is that? He said, because you're really a Jew. And uh, um, if you'd have been a Baptist, you would have just said, well, that's just the way things are. 
but because you're a Jew, you talked with me. And I happened to have a book by C.S. Lewis in my, in my briefcase I was reading. It was God in the Dock by C.S. Lewis. And I said, here, here's one of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century, Christian thinkers. And I gave him the book. And then when we got to, to, uh, um, to California, we, were, we went to our respective hotel rooms. And then that next morning he came out. He had already read the book. He gave it back to me. He says, this was a very deep thinker. And uh, then when he, before, I, I flew back to Houston after that meeting. He flew somewhere else. And I left on his desk. Before he got back, I put Hugh Ross's book, uh, 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 God of the Cosmos or something like that. And I put Mere Christianity. And I put uh, The Case for Christ. And uh, he read them all. And he came and he said, you know, I, I liked I, I, I like these books. Uh, the mere Christianity I, I felt was interesting, but all at the end, he said, well, that's just the way that, that you, so, so therefore Jesus Christ exists. But this book by this guy, Hugh Ross, that was really something. And, uh, um, and I said, would you like to meet Hugh Ross? He says, yeah. I said, okay, I'm going to invite Hugh Ross to campus to give a talk. You meet him. And in the meantime, he says, I'd like to get to go with you for lunch. And he says, I want, you to answer for me one question. What is the power behind Christianity? And as we were having lunch in the faculty club, the president of the university, who was Malcolm Gillis at the time, he was in the faculty club and did like he often does. He would just come to the faculty club, get a plate, and then walk around and sit at one of the tables with some of the faculty. And he walked up to us and he said, can I join you? And Rick said, sure, we're, we're learning about the power behind Christianity. And the president said, oh, I'd like to hear about that, too. And uh, so we had a, 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 a conversation about the power behind Christianity. But what really got Rick was some very subtle things. He says, Jim, how can you have one wife whom you love so much and she loves you and have these four children that love you? How, how do you do it? And this research group where everybody seems to be getting along, how do you do that? So it was really the simple things of life that were causing him to be attracted to this. So it's an interesting story about Rick. Great. Any thoughts Great. on that? Yeah, you need to write something about this. Okay. All right. Maybe I'll maybe I'll do that. I'll, I'll write this and kind of kind of uh, record it so that uh, there's a record of this and some of the interactions that were going on and the things in his life. Yeah, I was going to say, surely, Jim, somebody is going to write a biography of Rick Smalley. I mean, he, he is one of the greatest scientists of the 20th century, and uh, I hope this, this will get in there. I know you yeah. don't have time yeah. to, to write a biography of, of, of Rick, but uh, somebody will. Yeah, yeah. So here's some questions from the audience. There's a lot of them, and so we'll, we'll get through what we can. I have a question on the second premise of the column cosmology argument, the universe began to exist. What is your opinion on the universe being created from a vacuum? Did that vacuum begin to exist at some point, and where did it come from? <clears throat> yeah, Leon Letterman said it came from a vacuum. Um, I don't think that's precisely right because uh, there there wasn't there was nothing. I mean, it's it it uh, it it wasn't a vacuum. It just wasn't. So I, I don't agree with Letterman in his statement that this all took place in a vacuum. I mean, it was this is before any vacuum ever existed. Okay, here's another one. Did the quantum fluctuations at the beginning of the universe exist eternally? How do we know whether they, whether they did or didn't? Well, we can't be dogmatic about anything that happened before the Big Bang. Um, I, I think the answer to that question is these quantum fluctuations are a part of our universe, and they're, they're not pre-existing, uh, the, the, the Big Bang. Uh, now, if you want to argue that for some uh, brief moment or... or uh, picosecond or something like that, that, that God brought these uh, quantum fluctuations into existence. That's okay. Uh, and then followed by the Big Bang. Guth says that 
the instant of creation of the universe remains unexplained. But isn't that only if the explanation remains a natural explanation? Is there another way to explain the creation of something? For example, one, one's will or desire or thought, like the very creation of this very question, originated from a consciousness, not chemical processes. Yeah, the creation of our universe uh, begins with a consciousness, namely the consciousness of God. Um, so uh, I, I agree with that, but but that's the only consciousness that's around 13.7 billion years ago. That's right. I mean, God is so good. Jesus is so magnificent. It's wonderful. I mean, if I'll tell you, if you if if, if you're not a scientist and you're just starting out in college, consider becoming a scientist. It is so beautiful to look at these things and to just marvel at the beauty of Jesus Christ and, and, and what he does and what he's able to do. And then he comes and lives amongst us and becomes our friend. And he models for us what it is to walk before God. I mean, just magnificent. Here's another question. Why do you think that Einstein's acceptance of the beginning of the universe was grudging? Was that peer pressure from colleagues? If so, how might a scientist today be able to confidently follow the truth wherever it leads? Well, I think Einstein's position like that of Eddington uh, and others was philosophical. He, didn't, he wanted the universe to be infinitely old. Uh, he didn't want a creator. And uh, so he, he um, put into his theory a fudge factor in which the universe is infinitely old, but uh, it, at the end of the day, it, it didn't work. And he finally did concede that there was a beginning. But it was, pain, it was a painful yeah, and, concession. Yeah, and as you know, I mean, he, Fritz, I mean... Einstein created a universe that was infinitely old. As you know, Fritz, there's, there's a lot of scientists today, you know, we're, we're presented with things and we don't, we don't quickly give up our positions on things. That's true. That's true. We want our ideas to be the ones that win. That's right. How do we know the universe is not oscillating? Is there proof of this? What did Guth provide? The universe can speed in its expansion, but how do we know that it cannot slow down? Oh, we, we know that from the experiments of uh, Saul Perlmutter and, uh, and, uh, and Schmidt. Um, because uh, the fact that the universe is, is accelerating means that it's going to beat uh, any gravitational forces that might be out there. It's just going to, humanly speaking, our universe is just going to expand, 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 expand. Now that, I don't, we're not going to be around when we get to the point where there's not enough oxygen for us to breathe. But, but scientifically, uh, the, the expansion will go on forever. They're, they're just, you'd need more gravity for the universe to recollapse, more than there is. Can you provide an answer to this question I commonly hear? If God created the universe, then who created God? Are there theories of how God was created? Uh, I'm uh, there. I mean, in in mythology, there are lots of theories how different gods were created. I mean, that's you know that's. Uh, but uh, no, uh, you know the, the the reality is that God is the uncaused cause. Now, you know, Hugh Ross likes to talk about these things: how God exists in many more dimensions than we e experience, and in that sense that God existed uh, before our universe was uh, was created. But no, there isn't a hint of a suggestion uh, in, in the Bible or anything in Christian faith that God was created by something else. God is the uncaused cause. Mm -hmm. Does quantum mechanics provide a plausible explanation for some biblical miracles while still operating within the laws of physics? Many people have attempted to explain biblical miracles uh, on the basis of some purely natural uh, 
phenomenon. For example, the 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 Red Sea, the crossing the Red Sea, just just a lot of wind came up when the people of Israel crossed over, and and the, the wind uh, disappeared when the Egyptians were plunk in the middle of the place. Um, I I mean that that doesn't seem very logical to me, but maybe that is how God did it. I, I don't know. I mean, the thing that's remarkable about the the crossing um, is that the Egyptians didn't survive it. Hawking, quote, I think the universe was spontaneously created out of nothing according to the laws of science, unquote. Is that science or philosophy? Um, it's science in the sense that there's no evidence in opposition to that point of view. Uh, it, it's not science in the sense that we have uh, the video of the, the God's creating the universe. I mean, a lot of stuff happens in a real hurry. And uh, so in that sense, it's, it's not science. But it's, uh, you know, the absence of evidence is something that always needs to be considered. It has been claimed that God is the author of the mysteries in the universe that scientists are seeking to understand. It has also been said that the influence of the Holy Spirit moves upon the mind and conscience of believers and leads them into all truth. Do you believe that a higher divine intelligence has assisted you in acquiring the knowledge that you possess? Well, sure. I mean, I think that's true for every human being, that God, uh, he, he has this common grace that goes out to everybody, gives uh, uh, virtually everyone intelligence. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's God doing that. Uh, I, I certainly uh, agree with that. Now, to have that common grace is not the same as to know Jesus Christ. There, there's a lot uh, that goes after that. Mm -hmm. What is eternity? How does it differ from the time? How does it differ from time? And how do we see those two related to the universe and God? Well, eternity is a long time. I think that's the first thing that needs to be said. And you, you know, I think it, when I was younger and I heard people talking about um, infinity, I tried to count to infinity a few times, and uh, that didn't seem all that uh, that promising. Um, so yeah, e eternity is a long, long time. Uh, there are two places it can be spent. I didn't talk about the, the, the place. I'm not going to spend it. Jim's not going to spend it. We don't want anybody to spend it there. We want people to, to, uh, uh, live forever in the presence of Jesus. The Bible teaches that quote, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, unquote, 2 Timothy 3.12. As a scientist who openly acknowledges his belief in Jesus Christ, have you been persecuted for your faith? If so, in what way has that persecution been manifest? Well, sure. Uh, and so is Jim. I mean, Jim um, isn't in the top one one thousandth of scientists in the world. He, he uh, appears to me to be headed on track for the Nobel Prize, but he has not been elected to the National Academy of Sciences, which, uh, which should have happened 15 years ago. So these things happen. I don't want to be all negative about this, though, because there are some benefits occasionally. I had a, a student come to visit, a prospective PhD student from a major university in, in, in the Midwest. And he came in and, and we talked about science for half hour or so. And then he said, well, no, there's one other thing I want to want to tell you. And I said, okay, well, fire away. You know, we're trying to get you to come here to graduate school. Well, whatever you've got to say, we'll listen to you. He said, well, I went to see Professor X, who was my thesis advisor at uh, University Y. And uh, I told him that I, you looked to be the best person in your field. And I, I wanted to go do research with you. <clears throat> and he looked at me in the strangest way and said, that would be a horrible mistake. Professor Schaefer is a religious fanatic. It would be a horrible mistake for you to go and work for him. And this student uh, relayed to me that he walked out of the professor's office and said to himself, that's where I'm going. 
to work for the infamous Professor Schaefer. So sometimes these uh, these uh, stings and arrows uh, have the opposite effect. Yeah. Could you speak about the alleged hostility of the church against science? I recently had a professor reference the persecution and abuse of Galileo. What is the Christian influence on science? Well, <clears throat> I don't think that person got the Galileo story right. If you read any recent biography of, of Galileo, you know that most of his persecution uh, came from, uh, from politics. He was never put in jail uh, by the church. I don't want to defend the Catholic Church for everything because I'm not not Catholic, but I think the real story about Galileo is is um, is more complicated than some have uh, have said. Okay, well, Fritz, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up there. I just want to say that um, you know, again, I've I've known Fritz for for more than twenty five years, twenty seven, twenty eight years since we first met, and and he is one of the few chemists out there that, that is really doing high-powered research, who's a believer and not afraid to say it and to speak about it. So I've always looked to you, Fritz, as a, as a mentor and a, a model to follow. And I appreciate what you do and that you're always flying all over the world and speaking to all these students and you really love them and care about them. And it is, it is a tremendous thing to think about. And I want to encourage young people as well. If you are thinking about the sciences, you can have an enormous impact because when you start building your reputation in science, the world gives you a platform to speak. And now you can also use that as a springboard for the gospel. Fritz, could you just, just uh, 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 wrap that up for us? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's true. It's great to be a Christian in science. I mean, you you love science and you, you know who to thank for it. So I think it's uh, it's good. I, I want to say just a little bit about your science because Jim has made a discovery, I guess, in the last year or certainly in the last year and a half uh, of how to make graphene. Graphene is a remarkable uh, substance which got a Nobel Prize for uh within a few years after its discovery. And Jim has finally figured out how to make this stuff cheaply. And this is really going to revolutionize all kinds of things in uh, in our society. The only other thing I want to say, Jim, is that I'm a little uncomfortable doing these Zoom lectures. I've done three of them now, and uh, I can't see the audience. So I can't tell how you all are uh, all are responding to this. But let me say this. If you're, if you're listening to this, <clears throat> and if you're not a Christian, and you'd like to... Uh, hear my story and talk about these things, please uh, email me. Uh, just look up the University of Georgia Chemistry Department and you can find my email address. So we, God bless. And, and I'll say the same thing. If you are not a believer, this is for people who are not believers, and you want to hear my story about how I came to Jesus, you send me an email. I will have a private Zoom conversation with you and you will come out a believer. That I know. Because if you go to the step to contact me, uh, you're among the chosen and you're <laughs> going to come into the kingdom. And uh, so, so uh, I invite you to do that as well. With that, we want to wrap this up. I want to say thank you, Fritz, for your time, for giving us your time. And thank you for joining us on the Science and Faith podcast. And uh, uh, we'll do one more after this with, uh, um, with Dr. John Lennox uh, in a week. And uh, I invite you to that as well. Thank you very much.